Welcome to the One Body, One Life podcast. Hi, I'm your host, Dr. Jason Wan, lifestyle physical therapist. I talk about everything health and wellness related so you too can have a more resilient body and a more fulfilling life. If you haven't yet, it would help me greatly if you can leave a five-star rating on Spotify or iTunes. That way I can continue to grow this channel and push more of this free content to all of you. Today, I have a very special guest, Dr. Amber Richard Bauer. She's a doctor of physical therapy and chronic pain specialist and she has a lot to talk about and she knows her stuff. Welcome to the show and how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you, Jason. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Awesome. And I know we talked in the past and that's why we definitely had to get you on the show because there's so much to talk about. And I know this is going to help so many people, whether they have acute pain, chronic pain, they've had repeat injuries, and there's a lot of psychology around that. And that's a huge part of what we're going to talk about today. But if you don't mind just describing a little bit about yourself, what you do and who do you help? Yeah. Again, I'm Amber Richard Bauer. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, and I do specialize in chronic pain recovery. I use a mixture of pain neuroscience education, psychologically informed care, as well as mindfulness-based pain relief techniques. So I primarily work with people who have chronic pain, but there's a lot of overlap between the experience of chronic pain and chronic illness in general. So anybody who's really dealing with uncomfortable, ongoing sensations in their body is somebody that I can really help. Absolutely. And do you mind just defining what chronic pain is? Because that you know, some people don't know the difference between acute, subacute, chronic. So just dive a little bit into chronic pain and what that entails. Absolutely. So chronic pain is really defined as any pain that's lasting more than about three to six months. And the reason that we use that time frame is that it means that the pain is lasting longer than it actually takes for the tissues to heal. That means that the pain has really become embedded in the nervous system and you continue to have pain despite the fact that the tissues themselves have healed and there's no longer tissue damage. So what's important to understand is really that pain is more like an alarm system and you basically have sensors that are embedded in your tissues and they pick up on sensory information like pressure, temperature, and chemicals. And if there's enough stimulation to those sensors, then that alarm system will start to activate and some danger signals get sent through the spinal cord to the brain. And then the brain decides whether there's enough threat to create the symptom that we call pain. And the whole point of having pain is to alert you, bring to your conscious awareness that there could be something going on inside your body so that you will go and check that body part and make sure that you're okay so that you, know, you can remain safe and you can survive. So pain is really actually important. If we didn't feel pain, we would really be in trouble. We need to know when the environment might be causing damage to our bodies. But the problem with chronic pain is that it really is like a dysfunctional alarm system. So the longer that you have had pain, the less accurately it is really alerting you to potential damage. And all kinds of things can trigger that sensation when there's actually no damage occurring inside the body. So that can be really confusing because intuitively, we feel like if there's pain, that means something is wrong. And we don't realize that it's really that the alarm system has become dysfunctional. So we have all had an experience of this inaccuracy, like a really common one is almost all of us have stubbed our toes at some point in time, and you might experience pretty severe acute pain in that moment, ouch, that really hurt. And yet the vast majority of the time, there was absolutely no tissue damage. So that's a great example of the fact that the brain sometimes doesn't judge accurately what's going on. And it might throw out this danger signal to get you to check when really there's not any damage happening. And in the case of chronic pain, people's alarm system becomes so sensitive that very small inputs to the system will create big reactions in that alarm system. So they experience more and more severe pain, despite the fact that the issues are actually totally safe. Yeah, I think a lot of great chronic pain pioneers like Lorimer Mosley, the way that I've segued my, the way I practice as well is I don't perceive all pain as strictly physical or it's due to a weak muscle. A lot of times it really is somewhat psychosocial. And the analogy that I like to use is basically if you treat your body as like a house and it gets burglarized, so it gets burglarized, the alarm the alarms did go off, but then they burglarize your house. So therefore, sometimes it's like one in four people they'll put a lot of alarm systems like around their house or around their body. So now just the cat walking across the grass, the alarm goes off, the mouse walking across the room, the alarm systems go off. So it's essentially it's like a hypersensitivity yeah, and an increasing threat to your environment. Yeah. So how, how does somebody know exactly if they have chronic pain? I know that's a really wide generalized question, but is there certain indications that like, hey, I might be dealing with this and I might need to seek help for it? 
Yeah. So as I stated initially, we know that if pain is lasting more than three to six months, it becomes more and more likely that you are really having this issue of the nervous system becoming sensitized. And it's important to really understand this because a lot of times people feel like they're being told that their symptom is imaginary in some way, like it's not it's real pain, but the reality is that all pain is quote unquote in your head. It's all processed in the central nervous system and in the brain. So the symptom is 100% real. All pain is real and we should never discount somebody's experience of pain. It's just that it may not be indicative of tissue damage. That's the difference. And so if you have had pain that is lasting a long time and you've had tests and measures to make sure that there's no major illness, fracture, infection, no major tissue damage that could really account for that pain, then it's very likely that the problem is really in your nervous system at that point. The other thing that can help you sort of increase your confidence that this is really what's happening is if you notice that this pain is also correlated with stress. So in times of high stress, you notice that you tend to have more physical sensations of pain. The other thing that will affect it is emotions. So if you notice that when you get angry, suddenly your pain comes on. So some of those negative emotions, anger, fear, sadness, it turns out that in the brain, the areas of the brain that process emotions overlap with the areas of the brain that process pain. So when you activate one, you also activate the other, your threat signal is coming on. So some of those more quote unquote negative emotions can start to activate your pain. So if you're noticing that relationship, that's also indicative that this is probably really where the problem is happening. The other thing is attention. So you might notice that, oh, you have this pain and it's just there. It's all the, it's just bothering you all day long. But then suddenly you're involved in a really interesting conversation with somebody that you really, and you're in the flow. And for that amount of time, you have no awareness of your pain whatsoever. That's another really strong signal. That's not really the tissues that are the problem. It's your nervous system and your brain and what your brain is paying attention to. So we know that stress emotions and attention are the three biggest contributors to pain intensity. And if you see that relationship, then that increases your confidence. That is really what's happening. Another thing that I think can be helpful in understanding whether or not this is nervous system dysregulation is if you're experiencing other symptoms in other parts of your body. So I'm talking about abdominal pains like irritable bowel syndrome, maybe heartburn. Maybe you also experience a lot of headaches. Maybe you're having insomnia issues with sleep. What are some of the other ones, TMJ issues? So clenching of your teeth, a lot of just bodily tension in general, fatigue symptoms, heart palpitation. So some of the, when we start to look like it's like the whole body is really experiencing a lot of these symptoms, dizziness, ringing in your ears. So there's really a lot of things that can tip you off to the fact that there's more than just a tissue issue happening. It's your whole nervous system that is really ringing. That, that might help some people develop some confidence around, is this really a tissue issue or is my nervous system involved here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, people fail to realize that the brain is the entire control system, right? So stress, I sometimes tell people that, and some people do have a mixture of like biomechanical pain, as well as it's a threat to the system. But sometimes when people are consistently like injuring themselves or consistently, they have the same exact pain, it's not, it becomes more than just physical. It starts to become like a nuisance. It starts to impact your ability to do things around the house, participate in society, or even take care of your kids for that matter. So stressing literally about the pain, it's like I tell people when you mix pain and emotion together, it's like mixing light and dark alcohol, it becomes like a hangover. And therefore, like your pain somehow becomes magnified, even though there's no, again, it might not be necessarily a tissue issue. It may just be that you are extremely stressed out during those current situations. With regards to like traits, so we talk about a number of different things like kinesiophobia and rumination. Do you mind describing a little bit about fear, whether it's fear or helplessness and how that plays into the chronic pain experience? Absolutely. But I want to revisit what you just said just for a quick moment, sure. because pain is always sensory and emotional. It is always both. Even in acute pain, if you have a pain from truly having broken your bone, all of this is still true. It's never purely physical because it's always processed in the central nervous system. And your brain is using information from your environment, from your emotions, from past experiences, to determine how intense that alarm system should turn on. So it's really, we don't need to even differentiate that much. Pain mm -hmm. is always biopsychosocial. It is never just one. And again, we've all experienced this. 
this. Let's say you're having a great time at dinner with a friend and you bunk your elbow really hard. In that moment, you're going to go, oh, that didn't feel great. But you rub it off and you keep talking. Exact same injury when you're late to your meeting and really stressed out is going to feel very different. So yeah. it really is just, we can't really divide the two. It's mind and body working together. And anything that is going to help acute pain is also going to help I'm sorry, anything that helps chronic pain is also going to help acute pain because sure. it's always processed in the central nervous system. So I feel like we don't even need to create this like false boundary between the two. No, definitely not. Whenever I sprain my ankle, I get pissed out, pissed yeah. off about it, right? Because I can't walk to, I can't walk to work. I can't play basketball. I can't do all these things. So you really can't separate the emotions, but that's something that we both help with, which is like, you can separate the emotional values that come with pain. Let's say your neck starts to bother you. Try not to get stressed out about it. Try to look at it from a bird's eye view and try to be mindful yes. that, hey, I have a three out of 10 pain, but I'm not going to internalize it through stress and anger and all of a sudden the pain intensifies to a seven, right? Yes. So I, and I guess we should segue into that, a little bit of that question, which is biopsychosocial. You mentioned this large word. Some people in the audience may not even know what that is, but we can differentiate this old, older traditional approach, which is called biomedical versus biopsychosocial. Why don't you take the reins on defining those and how they're different now? Sure. Yeah. So the biomedical model really looks at tissues in isolation. And the problem with that is it often confuses causation with correlation or correlation with causation. I'm flipping everything today, apparently. <laughs> in any case, what happens is if you have pain in your hand, you get an x-ray or an MRI of the hand, and that's the only place that you look. And it makes sense if you think about how medicine was developed. When we started to understand the human body, the brain was really still a black box at that point. We didn't have things like functional MRIs to understand what's happening in the brain. And so we really focused on them. And again, that is a piece of the puzzle, but there's really a lot more to this pain experience. So the biopsychosocial framework really takes a much wider perspective that takes into account the role of the brain and the nervous system in the production of pain. So it looks at what's happening in the tissues, but also how are you thinking and feeling about this pain that you're having? As you mentioned, Jason, are you like, oh no, this means I'm going to be out of work for two weeks. And then what am I going to do? What if I make, can't make ends meet? I'm going to get, you know, it starts to become a much bigger problem than just a pain that you're feeling in your foot or wherever that might be. And then the social piece is looking at how that impacts your relationship and your ability to function, your ability to work and socialize. So we know that pain always involves all of these factors. And the current method of treatment for the most part of pain really only addresses that first piece, the biomedical piece. And the problem with that is that means you're missing two thirds of the puzzle. So you're really not going to get best outcomes if you're using this biomedical framework. Yeah, really good points. I feel like I can, I can take that in so many different ways, but there there's this word that I always use, which is like structuralism. Essentially, it's like basically the, almost like the religion or the practice of associating every pain that you have with a specific structure. Yes. And I think that's what actually a lot of people go down that kind of traditional route of getting the x-ray and the MRI, which is very overused. And people associate themselves and they start to identify as a C5, C6 disc herniation, or they associate with disc arthritis. And yes, I'm sure that as we all get older, our spines are going to look very different. But if you truly internalize, like if you internalize that, you start to identify with it, then you're going to start to limit the things you can do. You're going to limit the way that you bend forward because you're saying, oh my, I might just blow out a disc. So I think that's a huge issue. Uh, society. I think that's why people really should seek people like yourself out first, because uh, get, getting there was a st statistic where this study that said that if you do get an MRI of your spine, you're four times more likely to get an injection or surgery. Yep. Um, and I think that's huge because you said it yourself that any pain that lasts longer than three to six months, mm -hmm. it, it starts to become less about the tissues and it becomes more about the psychosocial aspects. Yet people 25 years later or 10 years later, yeah, Jay, I, you can't help me because I have a disc herniation. What would you say to those type of people that they almost need to unlearn that yes. process and they were given a route where they feel a lot more fragile? 
Absolutely. I think that fragility piece is really big. And we've been, we've been really taught through culture and society to fear this process of aging or having an injury. We don't trust that our bodies are actually really strong and resilient and adaptable. And it's not, I use this analogy, it's not like the body's like a bridge where it's structured a certain way. And if there's a structural issue with that bridge, it's going to crumble and doesn't function anymore. Our bodies are living, breathing organisms. So it's more like a forest. And if a forest gets burned down, it doesn't look the same a year later, things start to regrow, right? So we have this capacity to adapt to circumstances. Now that doesn't mean it's going to be like new, it's going to be different, but it's not going to be like it was when you first injured it. And what happens is people become very afraid. And of course, fear is one of those emotions that is highly activating of that nervous system. Nervous system. It really starts to guide your brain to interpret the sensations that are coming from the body through a lens of danger rather than a lens of safety. And so that amplifies the pain. So there's a few characteristics of people with chronic pain. And one of them is what you're pointing out, which is this fear of movement from a fear of triggering the pain and a fear of further injury. So then we start to avoid motion, which just leads to us becoming weaker, which makes it more likely that we're then gonna have an issue when we start to move again. Another really common feature is a tendency to think about the pain a lot. So there's a focus on the pain and just repeatedly thinking about it, which we call rumination. So that's a really strong tendency that a lot of people have. And it's almost like pain grabs your attention and holds it hostage. It's difficult to pay attention to anything else. It really starts to take up a lot of your mind space. And there's also tends to be a tendency to think about the worst case scenarios. So we start to think about what if I do something and then I blow out the next one, or what if it, it ends up leading to surgery or all of these things that make, again, that threat feel even bigger than just the sensation that you're experiencing in your body in this moment. And a lot of those tendencies can then cause people to get very anxious and depressed as well, which is very common if you're experiencing chronic pain and very understandable as well. So I think noticing those tendencies tendencies. If you notice that when you have a pain, you think about the last time that it happened, or you start to think right away that maybe this is the time that I'm going to have to get surgery. Just recognize that this is your brain coming up with what scenario is going to happen. And if it's coming up with really scary scenarios, that is only going to amplify that sensation and make you feel worse. It's really important to notice that. And then of course, part of what I do is help people figure out how do we deal with that? How can we change and reinterpret these sensations through a lens of safety, through a lens that really leads to us feeling resilient and strong and starting to trust that our bodies can cope and can really adapt to the changes that have happened. And I think really it starts with education. First, you need to understand how pain works because it doesn't work the way you would intuitively think that it does. Mm -hmm. We think that pain is going to be this indicator of damage intensity, but it turns out that the intensity of the pain doesn't correlate very well at all with the intensity of tissue damage. And this is another piece. So once you've got the education, it will also show you a lot of data that we have on the lack of correlation between symptoms and imaging findings. So we tend to think if they can just look inside my body and see what's going on in there, that's going to give me the answer. But it turns out that people have all kinds of tissue changes in their bodies that don't experience any pain at all. So I think if you are not sure, a good thing that you can do is you can go to your doctor and you can ask them, hey, doctor, you said that I have a C5, C6 disc herniation, let's say. Do you know anyone, do you have any patients who have had this on their imaging who don't have the types of symptoms that I do? And the answer is inevitably going to be yes. There are people out there who have the exact same thing and they don't feel it. And this is really the beauty and the amazingness of the human body and the way that it's designed is that the brain can tune out all kinds of things that are happening in the body if it doesn't think sure. that they're important to our survival. So it's really, that's what we're getting at is really learning how to feel safe in a body that is aging that has had an injury that, you know, is going through whatever it's going through. And it's important to know as well, that it's really common for this to happen when somebody has an injury that occurs during a time of really high stress, because again, your brain is already getting a lot of signals that say threat, something's not right. And then you have an injury on top of that. And it leads your brain to go, wow, 
this is an issue. This is a huge problem. And it can really set you up for then having that development of chronic pain. So really noticing in your own experience, did this start around a time that was really challenging for me? And that could be a move across the country. It could be starting a new demanding job. It could be the loss of someone in your the end of a really important relationship. So stress comes from a lot of different places. And just taking a step back and noticing what was happening in my life around the time that this symptom came on can give you a little bit of insight into why your nervous system got so worked up about this particular injury and why it's not feeling safe to let go. And that's the mindfulness piece. Yeah. It's like basically when you can be so quick to internalize stress and therefore the emotions rise and that's why the pain intensifies versus mm -hmm. if you can look at your situation from like a bird's eye view, be looking at yourself and be like, I was stressed at this time. I'm not a stressed person. I was stressed at this time. Um, that you hit on a great point about the lens of safety. And so I say this all the time that words can harm, but words can also empower as well. And I think that's what we both do, which is the education piece is so powerful. You words. And when we're talking about words, it could also be the words that practitioners like ourselves use either for our clients or against our clients, but it's also the intrinsic and the internal words that, and the internal thoughts that come with the pain experience. So for example, like if you're going to tell your client and this is coming from a health practitioner standpoint, if you're going to tell your client, like you'll never be able to squat again because you have knee arthritis, guess what that person's going to do for the rest of your life. They're going to avoid squats. And right. therefore that knee is going to get a lot more arthritic because they're not moving it at all versus mm -hmm. empowering them and saying, you might have some normal age related changes. Okay. But your tissues are very resilient and adaptable to stress. And we could do different squats. We can modify our squats. We can modify so that we can make the exercises work for you instead of the exercises flaring you up. So I feel very passionate about that word that you said, that lens of safety and empowering people versus telling people to protect their body and protect it, take it away and take the pain away and protect my body at all costs and just be in a curl up into a ball versus telling them to trust their body again, trust that it's going to be adaptable over time, that you can get past this pain. It's just that it takes obviously education, Mm -hmm. huge piece of it, the pain neuroscience education, but also exercise is like a huge part of yeah. that too. People fail to realize that exercise secretes so many great hormones that puts yes. you in a great mood, decreases stress, does well for the body. I think there's emo motion is emotion, right? Yeah. Or is it the other way around? We're both getting twisted, but I really appreciate all the points that you hit on when you're talking about the education part, like the data, the neuroscience, is it really just about giving people the data and telling them ab about the epidemiology, or is there more to it? Do they have to reflect on what's going on daily basis? Do they have the journal? What are, I guess, maybe some strategies that you can lay out that can help people with chronic pain? Yeah, there's so many things that you said that I love and want to touch on. And the one thing that I, that is a message that I wanted to share here is something that you said, which is basically like, we get to this place where we go, I can't X, Y, or Z, I can't squat. I can't jump. I can't run. And what you want to do is you want to start moving from, I can't to how can I, how can I squat? What is a version of that I can do, even if it's just the very start of it. And that will start to open up some opportunities to really start creating those changes in the body, reestablishing range of motion, getting your muscles strengthened again, so that you can become more adaptable and resilient. So that's a really key piece of it. And you said something else, but I've already lost it. So that's okay. No, but, no worries. Yeah. Yeah. We, we both spit fire so much good material that like yeah. we're trying to like, really have a great conversation about it. And the window of function is just like your lens of safety. If you get injured repeatedly multiple times, it's like your house shrinking and you're, you're just like staying in a corner of a room. You stay in the bathroom yes. because everywhere else seems like a threat to you. Yeah, yeah. But like you said, if you can tell somebody, hey, this doctor might have told you, you can't squat because you have arthritis or a knee plus, so you should avoid that. Start to think about, okay, how can I squat? Can I do a mini squat? Can I do a banded squat? And it feels better with bands around my knees. Then you start to open up that window of function. Now, instead of staying in the bathroom, now you have the kitchen. Now you can go yeah. into different parts of the house. Now you can enjoy life again yeah. and start to participate in the world again. And I think that's part of the quality of life, which is quality of life is not just what your body is capable of, but it's the environment. It's our social activity. It's our purpose. And when people are in pain and they're stuck in it and they're not educated, they start to lack purpose. They start to get very depressed and anxious about their situation. And it's just a very holistic, comprehensive way of going down this rabbit hole that you don't want to be in. Yeah. So. And also what you're speaking about, like we get very limited in the things that we're doing and we get very fearful that what often happens is people want the fear to go away before they're willing to try something and engage. Heard that before. And the reality is that 
the only way out of fear is through action. You have to do the thing that makes you scared and realize you survived that to mm -hmm. prove to yourself that you can do that thing. So we just want to find small little steps that you're willing to take. Something that's not so scary that it totally freaks you out and puts you on edge, but something that like, maybe I'm willing to do this, even though it's a little bit scary. And that's where working with a PT can be super helpful because it creates a container of safety. You have somebody who's watching you who can help you figure out how to change things to make it manageable. And through that experience of, wow, I was able to do this thing that I didn't think I was going to be able to do. You start to build confidence in yourself again. And that's going to start to, again, widen your world and you get more and more. And then the sky's the limit. Let's find out how far we can go from here. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that often our mind is really good at dealing with the stress. So we may not even feel that stressed. Lots of people that I see are like, no, I'm not that stressed. But when I ask them to list out what they're dealing with, I do work this really highly demanding job that I work 60 hours a week. And I do have three kids at home that I have to watch out for as well. And while my parent is going through some major health issues and X, Y, or Z other things that are going on. And so it can be very helpful to write that out. I think if my best friend looked at this list, would they think of this as a high stress situation? Because our mind will tell us, I can deal with this. I got it. It's fine. I'm, I'm already doing it. But your body will always register all of those stressors. So that is something that I think is really helpful is externalizing it and having this other perspective that's a little bit removed from the way that you're internally coping with it. It can give you a different perspective on what's happening. And then you can start to question like, okay, maybe there is a stress component to this, or maybe there is a lot of negative emotions that I'm dealing with on a consistent basis that may be feeding into this pain cycle. Yeah. It's just such a conundrum. I find there's a great study that was done actually with people walking across a rickety bridge and they had sensors on their fingertips to measure sweating and heart rate and breathing rate. And they were asked on the other side of the bridge, how stressful was that for you on a scale of zero to 10? And it turns out that they were terrible at assessing how stressful that experience was for their body. So their body would go into a complete stress reaction, but they'd be like, that's a one out of 10 because in their head, they're like, this is just a rickety bridge. It's not a big deal. So we need to understand that your body is very sensitive to all of these inputs that are going on because your brain is a prediction machine that wants to keep you alive and safe. And it's taking information in from all over the, your environment, your internal world, all those things to make this decision of how threatening is this? So we can talk ourselves out of feeling stress, but our bodies will still register that stress. Yeah. And you're also just talking about the tip of the iceberg, which is like your current situation, right? Your current, right. your current loss of a family member, your current stressful situation, let alone there, there's still just a plethora of research talking about people's past experiences yes. or whether there have been a child that's been a part of like domestic or physical abuse. There's, yes. um, there, there's a great book that, that I just finished, which is called The Body Keeps the Score. And it's about basically you have people's, a lot of times their persona and the way that they handle stress is a product of their childhood, whether yes. they were bullied or whether they, their parents were, wh whether they've been fostered from home to home. There's just so much research out there that, that people think they're resilient, but they've gone through a crap ton of trauma that yes. has led to them picking the wrong partners or deciding the ways that they internalize stress and their neck pain. Maybe they might have the same neck as the person down the street, but their neck pain is like an eight out of 10, just because yes. of all the psychological trauma that they've been a part of. Yes. Is that something that you do? You know, the subjective is huge. That's probably a huge part of it to really make the proper plan of attack. But how much do you weigh into the past, like their beliefs, their values, their religion, and all that, and how that weighs into their current situation. It's so important. I'm so glad you brought this up because I find often the topic of trauma is left off to the side. It's like, we don't want to talk about that because it's too heavy and it's too complicated. There's a really great book called The Deepest Well by Nadine Burke Harris. And she's a pediatrician actually working in, was working in San Francisco. She's the Surgeon General of California. And it's all about the fact that as you are developing as a child, your nervous system is developing. And if you're exposed to adverse childhood experiences, that's going to affect the way that your entire nervous system functions. And therefore all of your bodily systems, including your lungs, your heart, your digestion, everything is impacted by that. So yeah, sometimes the trauma is not immediate. It's things that happen much earlier on that predisposed you to having a nervous system that is really on the lookout for threat because it has experienced really challenging situations. And so it's primed to look out for threat so you don't end up in that situation again. And it makes you much more sensitive to experiences that are, you're having currently. So it's really important to acknowledge that and, and also then to refer to trauma therapy. We have almost 
trauma is a part of life. None of us will escape without some type of trauma. Some of us experience a lot of trauma, some of us less, but we're all going to have some type of trauma. And it's worth really taking the time to acknowledge those difficult experiences and give yourself space to process those, whether that's with another person or through journaling or some other type of expression. I think sometimes medicine, quote unquote medicine, looks like exercises or for that matter, treatments of some kind, but it's also joy and play and painting and dancing and laughing and singing. And I think we... I hope we can move away at some point from trauma being this heavy, dark thing that we don't want to touch to really alchemizing it until these experiences affected me. And I can look at that and I can find a way to see my own resilience in it and then make choices that are based on what's best for me now, rather than on my past experiences and what kept me alive then. Yeah. Um, so that's a very complex topic for sure. But those books are two great resources to start to dive into that. If you do, if you are somebody who feels that past trauma may be a piece of your puzzle when it comes to that pain puzzle. Yeah, I love that. And you said the word resilience, which resilience is just basically defined as the ability to come back from adversity. If you are somebody that has repeatedly injured themselves, or let's say a part of you feels that your childhood or the way that you grew up has weighed in on your current chronic pain, don't just look at your current situation and don't just look at, don't just go to the next pain relief specialist and the person's try to massage it away. Yeah. While there is a need for certain adjunct therapies like manual therapy, I think that it's so much more empowering when you can learn how to get rid of pain yourself or even unlearn certain things and beliefs that you currently had and empower you to get rid of the pain yourself. And that's what actually me and Amber both do just in a slightly different way. Amber, the next question I have for you is for those that are looking at pain neuroscience education, education to huge piece, maybe looking at the data, are there specific strategies that you've incorporated with certain clients? Or can you think of a client in which you gave them a specific like homework assignment, or you gave them a specific thing that really helped them to succeed just so they can see that the kind of success that you've had. Yeah. I think one of the biggest things that I tell people and give people to work on is really thought reframing. So noticing mm -hmm. when you are experiencing pain, what are the automatic thoughts that you have? And are those thoughts supporting a feeling of safety or feeding into a feeling of danger to the body? That. So a really common, this is something called the pain catastrophization scale. It looks at the most common types of thoughts that people have when they're experiencing pain. And it lists out the unhelpful pain related thoughts that people will often have. So I'll give you an example. Your, let's say I have neck pain and which by the way, I did have five years of chronic neck pain. I know we share that history a little bit. Mm. If my first thought is, what if this gets worse? Or what if it never goes away? Or what if this is actually cancer and they missed that? Those are really scary thoughts. The idea of having the rest of my life with pain is a real thought. And here's the thing. If your best friend was sitting next to you and they said, oh, I just have this pain in my neck. It's so awful. I'm really suffering today. You would never dream to turn to them and go, what if it's cancer? That is a terrible thing to say to somebody who is in pain, but sometimes that's exactly what we are doing to ourselves inside of our own minds. And we don't even realize that's what's happening. So I think that PCS scale is really helpful because it, it tells you what you need to look out for. These are thoughts that we know literally grow pain in your brain. They activate strong emotions because they're scary thoughts. And then that feeds a pain cycle. So you have pain, you get scared of the pain, the fear feeds the pains even bigger. So you get even more and you get stuck in a cycle. So when you start to notice, oh, I'm having this really scary, unhelpful pain related thought, this is where we're gonna change the pattern. We're gonna stop. And actually I'm gonna do it right now and you can do it with me if you want. So here's the very first thing that I want you to do. First, you're just going to start taking some nice deep breaths. So let's go in through the nose, letting it out nice and slow. Again, breathing in. Imagine yourself like a balloon, just deflating, dropping down, sinking, relaxing your body. And then I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. If you feel comfortable doing that, it'll just allow you to tune in and be less distracted by what's going on outside. So continue to breathe deeply. And then I'll invite you to place one hand on your chest and one hand over your belly button. And just tune in to the pressure and the temperature of your hands here. Breathing right into your hands. So you feel your chest and your belly expand as you breathe in and then drop back down as you breathe out. 
And then I want you to sway. So just go ahead and sway side to side gently. You can imagine just like soothing a baby, we rock babies to sleep. So just imagine that you're soothing yourself here, adding this little rhythmic movement, seeing if you can just allow that to feel good. And then we're gonna counter some of those distressing thoughts that come up when we're experiencing a painful sensation with a more supportive inner dialogue. You're gonna to speak to yourself as you would your best friend. So you might say something like, this is really uncomfortable, but I'm gonna figure it out. I'm gonna be okay. Or, yeah, I'm struggling right now. This doesn't feel good, but I know it's not going to last forever. Deep breath in, letting it out, letting your body soften. And then you can gently allow the hands to drop back down and then open up your eyes. Touch is a really primal way to send a message of safety to the brain. Since we are babies, we are responsive to touch to feel better. And then movement, gentle movement. So that might mean actually moving the body part that hurts. So it's that sort of like you're telling your brain, I'm okay, it's okay that we can move, it's all right. It's just uncomfortable, I'm okay. Or going for a walk, right? Because when you're experiencing pain, it activates that alarm system. You go into fight, flight, freeze, depending you know what type of reaction you're Not having. breathing. And simply, exactly, you start to breathe really quickly or you start to hold your breath, right? How often does that happen? You feel a sharp pain and what does your body do? Right away. So you're sending those little messages of safety. Go for a walk around the block, take some deep breaths, say something gentle and kind and supportive to yourself. And if you can change that, then what happens is instead of getting into this loop of cycling fear and pain that keeps intensifying, you can actually work your way down. You feel the pain, but you send messages of safety. Your nervous system calms down, the pain calms down, everything goes back to a normal place. So that's a really key, I think, tool that is really helpful. And then the other thing, as far as the trauma piece that I think is helpful for people is there's an ACEs survey as well that has some very basic questions about your childhood experiences that will give you a sense of how many of these have I experienced and what does that mean about how sensitive my nervous system might be to threat. So that's a big one. And emotional regulation is huge. So even being able to notice when you're experiencing an emotion, many of us mm -hmm. are just not that in tune with what we're feeling. And that's where these mindfulness practices can really be helpful. Just stopping and if you feel comfortable doing so, closing your eyes. For some people, closing the eyes makes them feel unsafe because they can't see what's going on anymore. So you mm -hmm. could also keep your eyes open, but just scan your body and ask yourself, what's going on inside of me right now? What am I feeling? Not just physically, but in terms of an emotion, am I feeling nervous? Am I feeling frustrated? Am I feeling overwhelmed? right? Am I feeling calm and peaceful and just noticing what's present? And you might do that throughout the day and realize, wow, a lot of the day, I'm feeling really activated in some way, or maybe you do notice a lot of the day I'm really calm and peaceful. Great. So just noticing what's showing up. And then when there's activation, sending your brain little messages of safety, because we have these primitive brains that were designed to look out for threats back when we lived in the wild and we had to worry about lions and fires and all of these things. And now we leave relatively safe lives when it comes to direct physical danger. I hope most of us do, although there are situations where that's not the case, but if you can tune into your current environment and just show your brain there's discomfort in my body, but I am actually safe. There's nothing attacking me. There's no lion in the room. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to make it through this. I'm struggling right now, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to get better. Saying really gentle, supportive things to yourself that help you feel safe again is a way to break this pattern that we can easily fall into. Yeah. I hope that people can rewind that last five minutes and just listen to that over and over again. Cause I feel like what you just said is going to empower so many people that are listening right now. Just wanted to share a little bit of what I did to escape my own chronic pain issues. I didn't ask those exact questions, the catastrophizing scale. I didn't know about that back in the day, but what I was told was I had a spine of an 80 year old. I got into two car accidents and then also my dad passed away right around that time. So the questions that I said to myself that I wasn't really aware of, I was just thinking it was, I don't want to be a father. What if I can't take care of my kids? What if I can't, what if I can't do the things that I want to do? And I have so much life to live in terms of basketball and staying active and all these thoughts. I really didn't 
understand it until I really did dive into pain neuroscience education. I started to ask myself those the right questions and I started to believe in myself and I started to regulate my emotions. I started to, instead of saying I'm a stressed ass individual, I started to say, I'm currently dealing with stress right now. What can I do to alleviate it now? And I found a lot of my a lot of my success getting out of chronic pain through exercise and through positive affirmations. I literally write stuff in on my bathroom wall. My wife hates it, by the way. I write every one to two months a different positive affirmation because okay. sometimes when you're stuck in the thick of things and you're at work and you're really stressed out about your current situation, sometimes it is hard to just stop, reflect and breathe. Yeah. But that's why some people do positive affirmations because if you write it down, you're forced to look at it every single day. And subconsciously, that starts to feed into your beliefs. It starts to unlearn past beliefs, starts to ingrain new ones. And with a strong belief system, you start to take great greater action than what you were currently doing. Instead of curling up in a ball, you start to actually move and move your neck. And therefore, you start to take massive results. And therefore, you're not going through this huge, vicious chronic pain cycle. You're going through a cycle that's repeatedly helping you. So yes. that my spiel was in at half as good as your spiel. No, that was uh, great. Last five minutes. But I think that was just so empowering for people to hear. And also, I want to say that it's great to write things down ahead of time, because when you're actually experiencing a pain uh, response, your prefrontal cortex, which is the higher level thinking part of the brain actually gets inhibited. You're not thinking straight. You are in an emotional state, right? The emotional part of the brain gets really activated. And so it might seem easy to come up with these like reassurances right now when you're calm and you're not experiencing pain, but once you're in that activated state, you're not going to be able to come up with it. So if you have them at the ready written out things, you can say to yourself, when you are struggling, you pull it up on your phone or you go to your bathroom and you look at the mirror, whatever it is, it will be there ready for you to use when you really need it the most. So I think that's a great suggestion is writing those things down, make notes in your phone. Like what would you say to your best friend who was struggling? And then when you're in that place, you just go, let me just read them out loud to myself. I'm going to make it through this. This is a moment of struggle, but it won't last forever. I, my body is strong and resilient. Whatever those little phrases are that are going to help you. Yeah. Having them ready ahead of time is really helpful. And I wanted to say one more thing, which is that you're pointing at that social piece, mm -hmm. but you know, what if I can't become a father and have my kids because I'm not be able to play with them? Or what if I have to quit my job because my pain is so bad? How am I going to survive? So the way that pain can start to impact these social aspects is really important and what often happens is that because of pain, people start to isolate themselves. Mm -hmm. They go, I can't participate. I can't go do that thing. What if it causes pain? I am so focused on my pain. I can't go out to dinner with my friend, like whatever those social pieces are. And that is another way that we feed into the loop because it turns out that isolation also sends a danger signal to the brain. Again, evolutionarily being alone in the wild was very dangerous. Being with your tribe in the wild, much less dangerous. So when you isolate yourself, your brain starts to go ding, ding, we're in danger. So it's really important to remain connected. And if you notice that your response is to isolate, you may need to, on your list of little things that you're going to do to help yourself feel better, go text message a friend and tell them that you are struggling call your partner and tell them you are struggling, whatever it is, add those social elements to the basketball practice and just sit and watch, even if you can't play yet. So having that sense of connection to a social environment is really important because it's another really powerful way to send messages of safety to your brain. Yeah. Yeah. The support system. There was a study that talked about compassion and belief and even religion. And they were training a bunch of people in hospice who had different types of disease and they're ready to essentially go. And believe it or not, those that actually checked out of the hospice, some people actually checked out of the hospice because they had a stronger support system. They had a specific religion and they felt a sense of social support versus mm -hmm. those that maybe had no family or they were like the last ones. There was no purpose. There was nothing there for them. So sure. I can't stress to you enough that a support system, whether it's your friends or family or whether it's maybe it's a pain relief support group in some way, that's so empowering. Sometimes you feel like you're doing it alone. You feel like on a deserted island and nobody understands you because the pain is invisible. We're here to tell you right now that you're not the only one. One, I think it's like one in four individuals with some sort of pain ends up falling into a chronic pain cycle. So if you're that person, it's okay. Like just admit to it, but also understand that there's are so many other interventions outside of the normal traditional medication and get an x-ray or just get a massage. And I think you'll go away. You'll, you'll be fine. Is to truly understand that the brain is extremely powerful. And if you educate yourself on the things that we're saying, we're only taking an hour of your time, but if you continue to educate yourself on this, you'll be surprised how much more resilient of a person you become. So 
I guess the it's, we hit on so many great points. Amber, I love this conversation. I wish we can go for hours, but I know. Uh, probably, probably not. Easy, you don't want to. Do. <laughs> but are there outside of things you already said? Are there any other important things for people with chronic pain to know? Yeah. So a few messages that I want to maybe send you off with. The first is chronic just describes what has already happened. Sometimes people get slapped with that label of chronic pain and they feel like that means it's always going to be there. And so chronic just means it has been there for more than three to six months. Your current situation is not your permanent destination. Chronic pain is something you can recover from, okay? The second is if no one has talked to you about the psychological and social aspects of your pain, you're missing two thirds of your treatment plan. Okay, so start using those other things. They're going to help you. The third is, this is so important, and I repeat it to people all the time, flare-ups are a normal and expected part of any recovery process. It is not a sign that you aren't going to get better. So if you're getting flare-ups, just know that's expected. We know that's going to happen. It's totally normal. The recovery from pain, chronic pain, doesn't look like, oh, the pain goes away and it's never back. That's it. It's gone. No, you're going to keep having flare-ups. What will happen, they're going to get less intense. They're not going to last as long. And they're going to become more and more spaced out. That is what recovery looks like. Move from how, from I can't, X, Y, Z, to how can I start to do X, Y, Z? Don't do it alone. Get social support. It makes a huge difference. And then learn how to self-soothe. When you are in distress, come up with small little things that you can do to get that nervous system, that alarm system to calm back down. And that's going to look a little bit different for each of us because we're so unique and individual. I love that. And just even recently, I think it was like two to three weeks ago, I was doing an overhead press, a very over heavy overhead press, things that I wouldn't have done when I had the neck issues back in the day. And I felt a pop in my neck and I actually heard it. And then I put the weights down. I think the old me or people that have had repeat injuries could have gone down a route where they took some medication, they rested on the couch, and then the pain got worse. Us as people that understand the role in the brain, the pain neuroscience, that it's really just temporary and I'm going to be okay. I actually just lightened up the weight. I decided to do some stretches. I foam rolled. I continued to move through the day. I still played with my kid. And I think for some people that would have taken months but the pain literally went away like 90% of it the next day. Yes. And that's not to show off. That really is just to say that me and Amber, we do know how the human body works and how the brain interacts with pain. So again, if, you're, if your pain specialist has not talked to you about pain neuroscience and how the brain plays into it and all the other psychosocial factors that we just laid out, again, that's a huge pivotal piece that you need, you can do that in adjunct. So you can continue to see that specialist, but you really need that education piece that Amber has been talking about. So Amber, I don't know if there's anything else more you want to say. I'd love to, I'd love to let people know about like where they can find more about you or where they can learn more about the things that you do and what services you provide. My gosh, there's about a million more things I could say, but I'll just uh, (laughs) let people know where they can find me. Maybe we'll have a part two. There you go. My website is ptmindfully.com. And I'm a certified instructor through Stanford for a program called Empowered Relief. So I offer that periodically. It's a single session pain class with you leave with an individualized pain care plan. So that's a great place to start. If you haven't had any education yet, I also have a lecture that's on Vimeo. It's the neuroscience of pain lecture. It's a great thing to listen to, to just get a primer on all of this information. And then you can always email me at PT mindfully at gmail.com. Yeah. And I'm happy to link that also into the show notes. So I'll link the Vimeo into the description. Awesome. And uh, Amber, like I said, I feel like we're destined to have a part two at some point because this was such an amazing tool. And again, guys, I encourage you guys to continue to come back to this podcast because there's a lot of empowering things, especially if you are somebody that is dealing with some sort of persistent or chronic pain. But that's what I got for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, definitely hit that subscribe or follow button. I do release episodes every single Wednesday morning. I love you can leave a rating on Spotify or iTunes. So my content will reach more people who could benefit from the tips I put out. And you'll be a huge part in growing this podcast. Any feedback from me or Amber, feel free to text me as well, 415-965-6580 or jason at flexordrj.com. And I'll leave you always with these last words of advice. We only have one body, one life. Make every action you do make you a better version of you. Take care.